Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Today in the midst of the church, the cross is placed before us. You've seen the vigil before, you know that this wonderful procession takes place after the, well, in the middle of the great doxology of Matins. The cross is brought into our midst, and we sing these hymns, of course, about the meanings of the cross. And with the cross being in our midst, the cross is certainly not an, an empty symbol. The cross has been filled with the life of Christ, the passion of Christ, the suffering of Christ, and ultimately the resurrection of Christ. With Christ being in our midst like that, very powerfully and palpably, Christ sees us. Christ is here with us. Christ sees our hearts. Christ sees our every movement. Christ sees our sins. Christ sees things we don't even realize about ourselves and looks at us with care and love and compassion each and every moment of every day and desires our salvation. In the midst of that reality, when he sees our sins and knowing that fearful thought that he is our judge because he knows everything about us and things that he desires us to confess before him, he gives us a message. Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Deny yourself. This is not something the world wants to hear. This is not a marketing strategy for the church. It is not something we can put on a billboard outside on the whiteboard and people are going to come fly here. This is not the way of modern America or really any of modern world by any means, which says be yourself, do your own thing, do what feels good, the pioneer spirit, be independent, don't let anyone else tell you what to do, on and on and on, every commercial on the television, everything on the radio is encouraging you not to deny yourself, but to be exactly what you think you think you are, even though it might be incredibly fallen and delusional. But yet the Lord says, deny ourselves, to take up a cross, a horrible weapon of death, and then follow him. And he says it over and over throughout the scriptures. That he who desires to save his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake in the Gospels shall save it. We are called to lose our life. Everything about us, everything we think that we really are, which is actually opposed to Christ. Anything that is idolatry in our lives, anything that has been put on a pedestal ahead of him, we are told to put aside our way of thinking, our emotions, anything that keeps us from God. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the world and lose his soul? We know, of course, there are many people throughout history who have thought they possessed the world, who took over everything, but ultimately probably lost their soul. It's not for me to decide, but the odds are pretty good given the way of life. What will they give a man give in exchange for his soul? And that sounds like an absurd proposition. I'm not going to give anything in exchange for my soul, but we do it each and every day, multiple times throughout the day. We make trades for our soul. Well, I've decided I'm going to be angry right now instead of saving my soul, no matter what that person thinks. I'm going to hold a bitter grudge, even though it might cost me my soul. I'm going to judge these people, even though it might cost my soul. I'm going to criticize, even though it might cost my soul. <clears throat> I'm going to break the fast. I'm not going to not come to church, even though it might cost me my soul. I'm going to indulge in lust. I'm going to indulge in mindless entertainment, even though it might ultimately cost my soul. We don't think of the reality of Christ's imminent return at any moment, which the early Christians were waiting for. Some are standing here who may see the kingdom of God come in power, we're told. Some of them, of course, did in their own way by seeing the uncreated light of God and the transfiguration. We constantly get things in exchange for our soul for some reason that we think they matter. But one of the fathers, uh, St. Theophon the Recluse, says that self-love is the cause of all of our sins. And that really is true because we justify everything that we do not thinking about the reality, this might cost my soul. These are the words of the Lord. Father Cyprian's, not Father Peter's, not Father Dimitri's, not any individual bishop. These are the words of Christ. 
He who is ashamed of me and my words in this shameless and adulterous, adulterous and sinful generation, him the Son of Man will be ashamed of when he comes with his Father and his holy angels. The shameful and adulterous generation. Of course, he's talking about a generation then, but that generation ultimately goes forth to us as well. An adulterous generation is a generation that turns from their first love, that turns away adulterously because that ultimate betrayal, because Christ is the bridegroom, and if he is our bridegroom and we have other loves, it is ultimately an adultery. Are we doing that? When is the time to examine our lives and to see what is getting in the way? How am I to take up my cross? How am I to deny myself? We think we don't have anything else we can do, but there are so many tiny things each day when we, we pat ourselves on the back and give ourselves comfort and indulge that self-love constantly that can be set aside. Why have the second cup of coffee when we could have had one? Why have the extra helping of food when we would have been fine with the one? Why watch three hours of television when we didn't really need to watch any? We could deny ourselves little things. Why get that extra word when we don't need to say anything at all instead of praise someone? Why sit at home saying I'm tired when we could have come to church? Little self-denials help. Why not get up 10 minutes early and lose 10 minutes of sleep so we could say our morning prayers instead of neglecting them again and again and again and saying tomorrow I'm going to do them? There are multitudes of self-denials. And ultimately, our biggest one needs to be in the relationship with how we deal with each other, because Christ has told us, first of all, we must love our neighbor. Some wonderful stories I read yesterday that Bishop Tikhon Shevkunov, you know, from Sretinsky Monastery, tells about um, the new hiram martyr Hilarion Troitsky, who suffered, of course, in Solovki and the camps, but when he was there, one of the most dreadful prison guards they had, who had tortured everyone, all of a sudden falls into the icy sea and is drowning. And without thought, Archbishop Hilarion dives in and rescues him to the shock of everyone. But didn't even think about it. Because why? It was the Christian thing to do. His life was guided by this gospel today. He denied himself. He took up his cross. He didn't give anything in exchange for his soul. He desired his soul. He wanted to see the glory of God and the holy angels. He desired Christ in a Christ-like way. He also told the story of Father John Christiankin, who many of you may have heard of, that of course died in the 2000s, who suffered in the camps for many years, and he had greatly distorted and mangled fingers because of all the times they broke them. <coughs> but you can see him actually on YouTube if you look for him speaking. Father John, in the Lubyanka prison, not far from where Sretinsky Monastery was, one day, one of the most heinous people in the prison, at least should have been in his eyes, was a priest there who betrayed Father John, turned him in, denied him, really, and turned him over to torture again and again. But Father John saw this priest in the midst of abuse and being accused and attacked one day. Father John ran through the crowd, hugged him and embraced him, to the shock of everyone. He hugged his betrayer. He loved his betrayer as Christ loved his, as Christ loved Peter, as Christ loved Judas. And St. John shows us the way. Well, he should be St. John. He will be one day. Well, the John Christiankin showed immense love. And that is taking up our cross. That is denying ourselves because that fallen part of us wants to say, good, watch him drown. He deserves it. He deserves hell because of what he has done to me. The fallen part of us wants to say, look at that priest who betrayed me. Well, he is suffering at the hands of God now for what he did. Who are we to judge that? God doesn't call us to make that call. God calls us to embrace that person, our worst persecutor. We become martyrs when we embrace those and love those who desire our murder and our death, who desire to insult us and to betray us and are cruel to us. We become Christ-like and fill ourselves up with Christ by taking up that cross. That is the message of salvation that the church has. Whether the worst rest of the world likes it or not, it's beside the point. Whether other churches are teaching that, I use that term, other traditions of some sort are teaching that or not, it doesn't matter. You hear the people now that are preaching prosperity gospel. If you love Christ, you'll have this, this, that, and the other. 
Not in my Bible. I don't see that. He preaches taking up a cross over and over. And whether those people of those, well, distortions know that or not, that doesn't mean driving the fanciest new car and having the nicest new house and having everything you want on a platter. The cross is an instrument of execution. But when Christ has done this, he has filled up all suffering. All of our suffering, all of our trials, all of our temptations are filled with meaning from now on. There's nothing that Christ didn't go through with us. We talked about in our class this week, we were talking about the Gospel of Mark. The first thing Christ does after his baptism, even though I hear many people say, why am I being attacked? I was just baptized. The first thing he does after his baptism is go into the wilderness and be tempted by the devil. There's the model. And in that wilderness, being tempted by the devil and, and really embracing everything that we go through, the devil throws everything he can at him, every possible worldly temptation. Christ gives us the model. And he suffers along with us. That he has embraced everything we go through except acceding to sin and showed us the path through it to bear that cross, to bear the temptations, to bear the trials. And he fills up everything with himself. As Father George Kalshu says that the greatest place, most places he's ever seen Christ is in prisons and in cancer wards because there's suffering there. And Christ fills up those places with himself because he has filled up the cross. So when we're experiencing our next trial, our next temptation, it may come in the middle of this sermon. It may come after church today. It will come today. It will come throughout our lives. So what? Christ has filled it up with himself. Christ has filled it up with his glory. And because of him, because of this weapon of peace, this invincible trophy, this guardian of the world that has cast out sin, that has cast out Amalek, that Jacob put his hands on top of and was blessed with the sign of the cross, that his tree went into the waters of Marah and made them sweet so the people of Israel could drink, we are filled up with that same Christ by embracing his cross. So don't fear the cross. Embrace the cross that Christ has given you because the cross that Christ has given you, as difficult as it may be, is your medication to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Glory to thy precious cross, O Lord.